Hey guys, how's it going? In this video, I'm going to start on my rough, rough scale enclosure build uh, using my old black headed monitor enclosure. So stick around, I hope you enjoy the video. G'day, my name's Luke and I'm an avid reptile and amphibian keeper. On this channel, you'll see DIY tutorials, care videos, herping clips, and plenty of other animal related content. Please make sure to subscribe and check out what my animals and I are up to. So these little tackers are growing up pretty quick. <clears throat> They're starting to eat on adult mice and, you know, I just think they need a little bit more room than what I can offer them in the snake rack. Not to mention the fact that I want to get them out so I can actually see them on display. Um, they're fantastic little critters and having them in a plastic box is not how I want to keep them. So, you know, I bought these animals for the sake of being able to watch them and that's what I plan to do. So in this video, we're gonna get started on this build using the black headed monitor enclosure. So they're going off to a great home with uh, a fellow by the name of Kurt. And uh, we're gonna repurpose this for some snakes. I've already made a couple of changes to it that I you know, didn't think were necessary to kind of show you in the build, but I'll just quickly explain what I've done. I've just put in a little LED light strip. So this one actually came out of my green tree python enclosure um, that I redid and he's over in the the rack with the frogs and the geckos and stuff. So I had that kicking around. And uh, now that Loki's a little bit bigger, I think he can get away without the, the heat panel in his enclosure. He's already got a couple of heated spots in there. He's got his basking spot. And then if he needs to get warm at night, he's also got his little hide box that stays at a decent uh, temperature. So I've actually pulled the heat panel out of there and put that up into the top corner as well, just for uh, heating up these little dudes. So yeah, let me uh, put this little girl back and we'll uh, have a look at what I'm going to start doing in this enclosure. So when you think of rough scale pythons you kind of associate them with a really rocky habitat and kind of living inside a little bit of cave structures and you know that kind of real Kimberly rock look. Well what I'm going to do to kind of recreate that essentially is I've got a lot of off cuts of form ply at the moment so especially after Pete and I built a few enclosures the other week. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use these, cut them into some intricate shapes or, you know, slightly better shapes than a plain rectangle and use them as shelving throughout the, the terrarium. And uh, from there, I'm actually going to use that kind of like a skeleton structure for the build as such. But from there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, expanding foam, like this stuff here, just to kind of create a little bit more natural look to it. So this is going to be skeletons. This is going to be the meat, and then we're going to cover it in some uh, pond sealer, um, some sand, some terracotta paint, and kind of really make it look really natural and like a bit more like a rock escarpment. And uh, yeah, I'm still hoping to put some live plants into this tank, so we'll see how we go down the track. But for now, what I'm going to do, let's get started and cut a few of these up. Don't do what I'm doing here, wear some safety shoes. I'm just trimming these pieces of timber to size. And then from there, I'm going to use a jigsaw to actually cut out some rough shapes for the shelving.
to make my life easier to attach the shelves into the vivarium, I'm actually just putting some small little brackets onto the shelving. It's hard to envision how it's going to look from here, but over time it'll actually take shape. Another benefit of screwing the shelves into the actual timber vivarium itself is it'll also help make it very, very rigid and hopefully support the foam structure as best as it can. Whilst we're watching me take my time putting these shelves in the enclosure here, I just thought I'd give a special mention out there to Nathan Taylor for purchasing my first couple of items off my Teespring store. The links to all my other social media accounts, my Teespring store and also my Patreon account can be found in the description below. My male Gillen's monitor here was definitely bugging me for some food while I was working on these shelves, so I couldn't not include this cute little clip of him begging for some tucker. I've finished. No, I haven't. Not even close. But technically, you could leave it as it is, just like this, just with the shelves or little ledges and everything, and the snakes would be none the wiser and they'd absolutely love it thermoregulating top to bottom in the enclosure and uh, they'd really thrive in it but um, it'd be a pretty half assed job on my end so we're going to continue on now I'm going to start shaping up a bit of stuff I've got a few of these gigantic cans of uh, expanding foam poly, poly filler I haven't used this brand before as far as I know expanding foam is pretty much expanding foam so um, unfortunately we can't get black in Australia as far as I'm aware um, because that would be really handy right now. But uh, anyway, I'll uh, do some time lapse and we'll uh, put some foam in here. I was a little bit disappointed with the Sikaflex brand expanding foam. I found for the amount of weight in the can, it just didn't actually produce as much foam as say the Parfex brand expanding foam. I used an old steak knife to carve out the original layers of foam. Once I had carved out most of the shelf foam, I actually added some more expanding foam into the back there just to make the background look very 3D. 
I believe in total I used about six of these large cans of expanding foam to do this enclosure. And once again, I got the knife out and started carving. After I was happy with the result from the carving, I then proceeded to use a pond sealer to seal up all the foam. I did two coats of black pond sealer, and then I did one coat of sandstone pond sealer. The sandstone pond sealer had some grit in it that really gave it a good texture. Doing these three coats of pond sealer really made the foam rigid. From there, I actually decided to give it a coat of dark brown spray paint. Whilst a little bit unconventional, it was an easy way to fill in the gaps in between the dark crevices that will later on provide a really good shadowing effect. I then proceeded to give it a coat of a really red slash brown spray paint, just to really highlight some of the further edges that were a little bit more prominent. I then gave the whole enclosure a good coating with a terracotta paint and whilst doing this terracotta paint I also used some reptile red sand just purchased from the shop at High Tech Aquariums and I threw it against the wet terracotta paint to really add in some good grit and give it some good colour. It was a pretty messy and tedious task, but in saying that it was well worth the end result. The last step of creating this awesome background was to give it a couple of washes just to really bring out some textures and highlight it. I used different shades of brown and grey acrylic paints that I just watered down to create a bit of a wash and really fill in some detail. This really knocked the orange out of the sand. In particular, I paid a lot of attention to the different edges and different shapes that were kind of a bit more prominent along the background. This just gave them a special highlight and left some of the dark recesses to give a bit of more of a shadowing effect.
under the bottom ledge, right near the base of the enclosure on the left hand side, I needed to drill a couple of holes. One of these holes was for a heat cord to access through so I could provide a heat tile and the other hole was for a thermostat to later on control the heat tile. I made up a heat tile using a couple of just standard house tiles, a heat cord and some gaffer tape. This will sit down just underneath the surface of the substrate and I'll most likely cover it with leaf litter and bark and use that as a hide. I'm using my favourite mulch, Yuki mulch, to fill out the bottom of this vivarium. And I have to say that I probably used almost all 60 litres. You can't get any more natural than eucalyptus mulch in Australia. We're almost there. Honestly, this video would have been hours long if I hadn't of time lapse pretty much for the majority of the making of this. But uh, as you can see, it's still worthwhile watching. Now, you can see my little heat tile down in there, nice and secure. We're gonna disguise that with a bit of leaf litter and a few bits of bark and things of the likes. Make it look like the forest floor. This has still got a little bit of drying to do before we go and put the rough scales in here. I'll probably give it another 24, 48 hours, but it's absolutely looking fantastic. I love the colors that are on it. You know, I'm glad I did those washes over the top of it because it just kind of knocked out that bright orange that it was before with just the sand. But there's enough of that kind of gleaming through there as well, just to be able to kind of make it still look like that real Kimberly red rock. So from here, I've got a couple of things left to do. I want to put in some plants. I'm going to put in some vines. I'm going to put in Maybe one branch. I'm gonna put in some leaf litter in the bottom of the ground, a water bowl, and some bark over on on top of the uh, heat tile there as a hide, and then she's done. So as you would have seen earlier on in the video, I actually hung up some eyelet, eyelet hooks into the roof, and these are just going to be basically to secure my vines from and a branch or two. Um, I've done the same on this branch for example, I've just put a little hook on there just to make sure that it can kind of actually stay in place. And I have a pretty good idea about how I want this all to, all to sit. Still going to be a little bit loose so it's going to give the snakes a bit of a workout if, it does, if they do want to climb up them. So I went and got a few of these vines just from a, a pest plant that's grown locally. I've let them dry out for a few days, stuck them on top of the turtle pond just to see if they'd uh, release any bugs out of them. What I'm actually doing is I've just zip tied the top of those together. Hopefully you're not going to see this at all or you're not going to be focused on the top of the, the enclosure right up the top there but essentially what I'm doing so I'm going to use that as an anchor point for where I can put a zip tie through the back here and zip tie it into the eyelet and I'll cut off the excess there and that'll just hang them up nice and tight so if the snakes do want to climb up these it's not going to go anywhere on them. This is looking pretty cool already. I've still got a couple to go too. So you've got to think about where these guys come from in the wild. Sure it's in the Kimberleys, but they're down in the gorges where it's little rainforest pockets. So, you know, you're still going to get the kind of the plant life forms down there that don't necessarily resemble deserts and, you know, really arid environments. So it's kind of a weird combination of the two. But I have a feeling that this should look pretty, pretty darn cool. I have to figure out how I want this one to go. I think I want it to kind of wrap around the bottom like this. I do want one more branch to go in there, or vine rather. Hoping this one will settle right. Now what I've done with this one is I've actually just put a little couple of hooks into either end of it. We're gonna hang it up 
And if they want to hang around as if they are a green tree python, because we know they're pretty closely related, they have the option to, just like that. I am so pumped about this. This is looking fantastic. To be honest, I actually think it's a little bit better than what I first imagined. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do, so we're gonna put a couple of plants into here. I don't know how they're gonna go in this low light environment. We're gonna see it how it goes. Worst case, I pull them out and hopefully revive them before they die, because I'd hate to waste my money. But at the same time, I, I can't not do an enclosure without some form of plant in there. And hopefully these things are durable enough for the snakes while they're a little bit smaller at least. So let's get on to that. So I'm gonna be putting two plants into this vivarium. The first one's this one, uh, this marble queen here. To, oh, I'm horrible at Latin. Epiprimitum? Butchered it. Anyway, it's a nice low, low light indoor plant. I'm gonna see how it goes. I think the, the leaves on it are absolutely fantastic. I wanna actually see if I could almost climb it up this front log here. But what I'll do is I'll probably center it somewhere near the middle here and just kind of pin it to, to place, maybe with a zip tie or two, just loosely attached to it. So that's the first plant. And the second one is a Monstera. So this is another very cool plant. I haven't been having much luck with these inside of my terrarium, so I'm just giving it an absolute punt here, but we'll see how it goes. The, the one thing I am gonna do with these plants is you can see that they're in really small pots. Got a couple of larger pots kicking around and I am actually just gonna transplant them into there just with a bit of yuki mulch, so nothing too crazy in there. I don't have any other soil or anything that I wanna put into there. Um, but the reason I wanna do that is I wanna to try to keep their root ball as intact as I can. Uh, I will just pre preface this that I'm not exactly worried about a tiny little bit of fertilizer pellets or anything that will be in here. I get a little bit more worried about it with the frogs. With the snakes, I honestly don't because they're not exactly absorbing things through their skin or, you know, I've never seen them actually kind of like, you know, try to eat soil or anything like that. So what I am gonna to try to do is keep these little root balls intact and then essentially transplant them into some pots. And the reason that I'm doing that is because basically when I go to water the plants inside of the vivarium, I want there to be area for the roots to grow so the plant can actually physically grow with it. But at the same time, I want there to be enough area around it that they're gonna be able to, to grow but also hold the moisture inside of the pots themselves because I don't want the, all the yuki mulch because there's a ton in there. There's like almost 60 litres of yuki mulch in there. I don't want that to absorb all the water up and take it out of the ground. By having these actually transplanted into these pots, it just means that I can hold the moisture in there and hopefully the plants will get more than what they need. And if it does need to leak, well, it can come out the sides and the yuki mulch can take care of it from there. I'm getting so excited now. This is looking phenomenal. The next thing I'm gonna be putting in is this big bit of bark that came off a piece of gum. So this will be going in there and acting as a bit of a hide above that heat tile. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just gotta be enough that it kind of just acts as a bit of a barrier. They can still get in on that heat tile there and bask during the the wee hours of the morning and keep themselves warm. Apart from the bark, I've got a whole assortment of different types of leaves and things here at the moment. One thing I am gonna to try to do is not use gum leaves as much as I can if possible, because you've gotta think about this, you're on a forest floor, in a rainforest, in a rainforest gorge, so I need this to look a little bit different. So, I've been going around collecting some of these dry palm fronds from around the house here. These are from a golden cane, so these are going to be perfect for the forest floor in here. I love using these for my green tree pythons as well. Break them all up. Send them everywhere. And whilst I was out collecting the, the uh, vines for this enclosure, I actually managed to stumble across a big patch of pandanus. So this would be awesome as well. This is a nice rainforest plant. We're going to be putting this in here. 
probably have to crumple it up a bit. Hopefully I actually find the rough scales in here. I reckon it's gonna be so good for them to hide in. moment of truth. This is the first time that I'm putting my roughies in the new enclosure. So this is the little male. Believe it or not, both of them have just shed. So they're looking great. Perfect timing. They must have been knowing that they were getting a new house. So I will say something that I haven't covered in the video as of yet. I haven't actually put a thermostat onto either of the heating elements inside of this enclosure. Now, the reason being is it's the middle of winter right now, so they actually physically can't overheat. But in the very near future, like within the next few weeks, I'll get a couple of thermostats on these just to make sure that they're not gonna overheat the animals. I've checked the basking spots around the enclosure already with a thermometer gun whilst the glass has actually been in. Down the bottom on the heat tile, I'm getting about 32 degrees. Up top, right underneath the uh, heat panel up the top there, it's actually getting up to about 42 degrees, but keep in mind, there's plenty of opportunities for these guys to escape that. Down the side over here, sitting at about 22 degrees, and the various shelves at different heights at different temperature gradients. Even where it is 40 degrees up here, just over the side here is about 30. And these shelves are sitting at about 25 or thereabouts at the moment as well. Of course, this is all in Celsius. The little male's just climbing down now, enjoying exploring his enclosure. I'm so stoked to finally have had this finished. It's been, it's been going on for a long time. I started this back in February once I did move my um, my black-headed monitors on, and I just had to pull my finger out and actually get it uh, get it done. So what I'll do is I'll go and grab the female as well, and then we'll watch these guys explore around for a little bit, and that'll be this episode. Thank you guys so much for coming along, sticking out, watching me build this thing. Thanks for everyone's patience while I have been doing this. It's been absolutely fantastic, and I hope you guys get as much of a kick out of this as I do. It really is like a bit of art for me. Um, I'm really proud of myself in this one. So here's my little female Ruffy. She's a stunning little snake. She's not quite as snappy as the other fella there. She's absolutely gorgeous. The only way I can actually physically tell them apart is by a band near the top of their head. It's just behind there, just behind where the neck starts. And the female's got a nice smooth kind of band, and the male's got almost like a pattern, like a, sorry, an arrowhead pattern in it. These snakes are seriously just something else, hey? The male's already disappeared down the bottom here. I have no idea where he is in there. I'll have to have a bit of search around and just make sure he's in there for when I put the glass back in there. I'll see if I can get the female to go up the top and we'll get some footage. Look at how she just climbs. And this is what this enclosure is all about. It's just to be able to give the animal the natural ability to do what it's meant to do in the wild, you know. Doing this in a plastic box, it's just not going to happen. Whereas climbing up a vine like this, how can you beat that? As always guys, please make sure to like the video. Please chuck it a comment. Share it around if you like it. Show me some photos of you guys as well when you guys make something similar if you are going to do it because I'd absolutely get a kick out of seeing, you know, other people's projects in this sort of way. And, you know, we can all learn from each other, right? You know, there's different techniques on how to do things and I learned some things doing this and I'm sure I'll learn something from you guys as well. If you haven't already as well, check out the link down below. I've got a Teespring store open with some uh, reptile related merchandise on there as well. I'd absolutely be stoked if you guys were to buy a t-shirt or something along the lines of that. And please again, chuck me a photo of you guys wearing your merch. I'd absolutely get a kick out of that. And you know, if you want to, I'll share it up on my page. Are you guys rocking some Beecher Scaly Beasts merchandise? Until next time guys, 
I'll catch you on the next video.